So this is scaling Node.js with Docker and Kubernetes, or some people say Kubernetes. I don't say that. That seems weird to me. Um, if this is not the session that you are expecting, please feel free to leave. Uh, my name is Mark Mandel. Um, I am a developer advocate for Google Cloud Platform. Uh, if you may or may not have noticed, I am Australian, uh, although I live in San Francisco now. So if I do say words that are weird, like I say caching rather than caching, and a few other strange things like that, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, I have had entire sessions where people have only waited until the end, until they realized what I was talking about, and the whole room has gone, oh, and that's terrible. Okay, so um, like I said, I am a Google. I am a developer advocate for Google Cloud Platform. We'll be talking about Node and Docker and Kubernetes. Here is a picture of me and my dog, primarily because she's going to show up a couple of times through this presentation, and I like sharing pictures of my dog. Okay, so enough about me. That's not really that important. Let's find out about all of you, so I can kind of tailor my content a little bit. So, uh, who here has heard of Docker? Wonderful. Who here has got Docker in production? Okay, that's good. That's good. Um, who here feels comfortable with Docker? Okay, okay, that's good. I got a lot of, I got, a, I got a fair bit of Docker sort of intro content, so I just wanted to be sure. Okay, so who here has heard of Kubernetes? Mm, who here has Kubernetes in production? Yeah, okay, so that's Terry. I work with Terry. He can go away. <laughs> Okay, brilliant, brilliant. So we are all in the right place. Oh, and I should also ask, who here is actually a Node.js developer? Oh, interesting. Okay, so we do have some Node.js stuff, um, though it may be pertinent to other people. So, okay, what are we actually talking about today? So the basic premise of what we're starting with is we've written ourselves a Node.js app. It's getting fairly successful. That's great. And we're getting some traffic. It's awesome. But now we need to scale. And we want to look at why we would use containers, why we would use Kubernetes to do that. Okay, so we're going to go through um, sort of why for those those aspects of it. So why containers, why Kubernetes, why do containers make sense, why does Docker make sense. Um, we'll go through each one sort of pragmatically, a little website we're building. It's very straightforward, very simple. It should be easy to demo and look at. And um, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end because it's a good topic of discussion. Um, just to be clear as well, what isn't this talk? Um, it isn't a deep dive intro into Docker. It isn't a deep dive, in, deep dive intro into Kubernetes. There's enough meat on both of, both of those subjects that you can kind of sort of grab hold of it. And if you're like, yeah, this, this is something I'm really interested in, I want to run with it. But if you're looking for that sort of content, this isn't it. But it'll definitely give you enough to give you inspiration and give you enough to get started, enough of a, a, a very small introduction to get you going. Okay, so let's get going. So, we're talking about scaling. Why is he talking about containers? Is it just that Docker is the new hotness and he's decided to put a presentation together or is it actually something we really care about? So, I'd like to tell a little story. This is your application. It is a beautiful, locally produced, artisanal, handcrafted snowflake. It's about as hipster as you can get. Um, you know, you've spent hours on this thing, it's very uniquely specified to exactly what your business needs are, and it's a tailored technological solution, wonderful. And it's great, and that works, you know, you're building a business on it, and it's wonderful. So you take it to production, and that's fine, and it's running, and that's all good. And then you're like, oh, you know what, we need some caching, because we need some more performance, so we add another little snowflake, because that's just right for your application. And we need some monitoring as well, and then we need some other services to go along with it. And we've got four or five things all running side by side, maybe on the same box, maybe not, and that's okay. And then you sort of start to hit this, this wall, I don't know if anyone else has hit it, where you start adding more things, and maybe your bash scripts you had before aren't feeling so good anymore, and things aren't really fitting as much as you'd like. You add another version of this service, and you're sort of hacking things together a little bit. Um, you add a few more, and it, things tend to get a little messy. It's, it starts to feel like when you're building stuff, it's a bit of duct tape and some string. And while it all kind of works, you kind of go, oh, yep, you know, my logging and my monitoring, it all goes together. I can just kind of throw a load balancer over it, and then we'll just connect it to the internet, and everything's going to be fine. <laughs> And, you know, it works to a degree, right? And, and you can build businesses on it. I mean, like, I, I've been in this situation. It's totally fair enough. 
Um, you get started, you, you scrap things together, and that's all great. Um, and so what do you do when you reach this point? Because you realize you've hit the pain point where you're like, okay, I really need to do something about this that's real and is actually going to scale out like long term of this business. So there's a few options. We could look at, say, specific solutions that target, say, the language. So we could say, okay, we're talking about Node.js. So we might go looking for patterns in the Node.js community to say, how do we scale things that run on this language? And that could work. Like, it may fit your needs. You may find that your app is unique enough that maybe it doesn't fit. So it's kind of a bit hit on this. You could turn around and say, okay, we're going to build our own custom artisanal scaling infrastructure system. And a lot of people go out and do that. And that could necessarily work. That's a lot of time and effort. But then I step back and I say, what if there was something like an abstraction where I could kind of wrap up my pretty, gorgeous, lovely little snowflake and put it in a nice box and where I could start it and stop it and deploy it and basically interact with it in a standard way and it wouldn't matter how much of a special snowflake was sitting inside that box. Wouldn't that be really nice? Then I'd just have one way of doing things. That'd be really sweet. Docker! So this is where we start looking at containers. So if you're not familiar with Docker in like any way, shape, or form, right? Uh, Docker is an implementation of software containers, which is basically a super lightweight uh, virtualization platform that you can execute pretty much any arbitrary process in. Right? So it's virtualization, so it, anything that runs in it thinks it's running in primarily a Linux server, generally speaking. Um, it doesn't know any different, but you can spin them up, you can um, run them on a variety of platforms, and it has a standard API. So these are actually really, really cool for what we're talking about. The nice thing about Docker containers, we'll, we'll dig into them a little bit more. They spin up really fast. The processes inside them don't know they're inside a Docker container. As far as they're concerned, they don't care. Um, but the API for interacting with the Docker containers is standard. And if the Open Container Initiative actually gets going and doing good stuff to it, it'll be more standard across the board. That's actually, I think, like a really powerful thing. Like, really, really powerful. You get really nice stuff other than that with Docker. There's like resource isolation and environment consistency and all that sort of stuff. Um, fast spin up times also really great. But the fact that there's a standard API is super, super, super powerful. And it's something I kind of am going to be repeating a lot. But let's go back in history a little bit because you might actually look at this slide and be like, wait a minute, didn't we solve this like ages ago? Why do we need this new thing? We have virtual machines, they're great, right? And they are to a degree. Um, virtual machines, we could kind of solve it this way. But when we look at them, they're kind of heavy handed. Um, virtual machines themselves have their own operating system built into them. It's like the entire thing. They tend to carve out like all the resources on a box. Uh, so if you're not using the stuff inside that VM, then it kind of sits there doing nothing. Also, they're a bit slow to spin up and spin down. So if you want to move them around, it's not so great. I'm going to give credit where credit due is due. This is a joke that my friend Terry wrote. Um, but he, he created this analogy, which I actually really love. So you've got a bag, and it's filled up with stuff. And you've run out of room in the bag. And you think to yourself, I need a bigger bag. So you just go and get yourself an oil drum. And then you're like, wow, now I have more stuff that I can fit in here because there's so much space. And sure, it works. It's not a problem, but lugging that thing around really sucks. You might want to try something else. So this is where containers are really nice. So containers share the same kernel. So that means they share resources. So scaling them is super, super fast. You want to spin them up, spin them down. The, the uptime and downtime is really quick. So this means that we can actually do really neat stuff with them when we talk about actually scaling this stuff as well. So not only do we get a nice, unique little uh, a nice box that we can put things in that has a standard API. We can also like manage our resources really well as well. Okay, so assuming now I've now sold you on containers because they're awesome. Okay, what does that actually mean for the scenario we were previously looking at? So if we just make the assumption here that Docker is this green box that now wraps around our beautiful little snowflake, we can now use generic solutions to start these, stop these, deploy them. This becomes, again, really, really powerful. And it doesn't matter 
what language, what system, what platform we're putting inside here. What is our little snowflake that will fit in as simply as they do with anything else? Suddenly this looks a whole lot easier to manage and a whole lot nicer. So that seems pretty cool. So let's look at how that actually works with Docker, if people aren't necessarily familiar with it, which is totally fine. How do we actually pragmatically use this platform to do it? So what we're going to do is build a really small node app. Uh, full disclaimer, I am not a full-time node developer, um, but I can build an express app, so that's good enough. Um, so we're going to see how these pieces fit together. Uh, since I believe that there are way too many cats on the internet, uh, we're going to build a website that shows pictures of my dog. I think that's fair. It's a balancing act. Okay, so it's a pretty standard node app. It's an express app. Um, you can see here at the top, we have node modules. That's where my NPM modules go. I have a public folder. That's where my static files go. Views, which is where my view templates go. I have an app.js for the logic, which we'll look at. Uh, a Docker file that we'll look at a little bit longer uh, in a little bit. And a package JSON, which specifies all my dependencies. Nothing special. I just want to say there's no magic node stuff here. Okay. I'm using three pretty boring ordinary libraries. I'm using Express for my framework, Morgan, which is a nice logging middleware, and Jade for my view templates. Again, no magic. Um, this is a really boring Express app. Uh, I think the only exciting piece about it is that I'm getting the port out of an environment variable, which I actually don't end up using. But it's, again, no magic. So let's get into the really fun bits, which is the actual Docker file. So who here has written a Docker file? Cool, lots of you. Some of you haven't, so let's go through it. And there's some interesting tidbits here that I think are particularly useful when you're developing with Node and Docker. So that thumb line across the top, if you're not familiar with Docker files, that's like your base image. That's where you start from. Um, I'm actually using a Linux distro called Alpine that I'll talk about in a minute, but it's a Linux server and we have Node installed already. So cool, we have something with Node on it. Uh, we create a directory called slash project because that's the convention I like to use. And we copy in the resources we need. We need to copy in the app.js, we need to copy in the Node modules because that's our dependencies. We need to copy in our public folder and we need to copy in our views. So we have all our resources. And then our entry point is basically saying, when we start up this Docker container, cool. What needs to run? So it runs. So that's great. So we can we create a Docker file and we can build from this and then we can eventually run from it as well. Why am I using Alpine? Why am I not using Ubuntu or Debian? So I use Alpine because you when you've got Docker images, these are things you tend to share around the internet. They get pulled down to your servers when you deploy them, you push them up to what's called repositories, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Now, the Ubuntu image, by default, is 188 megabytes. So it's a bit of data that you're actually shoving around. The Alpine image is 5 megabytes. It's a little bit smaller. That's much easier to ship around. And that can actually really impact your, your developer flow as you're pushing this stuff around. The nice thing about the Alpine node uh, package, that's, what, 25 megabytes? So that's, it makes it quite nice to use. So when, you, when you're building these things, there are all sorts of weird tips and tricks you can do with Docker to get your image sizes like smaller and smaller, but this is like a simple one. If you can run your app on like say Alpine or something like that, where it's a really small uh, Linux, uh, Linux distro, you can save yourself a lot of time. The other little small cute trick that I use, or trick, I don't know if that's a great word, is you'll actually notice I don't call NPM anywhere. So I don't install my dependencies. Because I don't actually need NPM inside my Docker container for any of this stuff to run. It's not important. All I need to do is make sure my dependencies are in the Docker container. So when I build my image, I always run NPM first. That means I have my dependencies, then I copy them in, and I save myself a little bit of space there. So you just have to be a little bit smart about it. You might be like, okay, do I need this thing actually when I'm running in production, or do I just need it in development? Okay, so we have our Docker file. This specifies our template. What's nice about this is we have a standard way of building these images, which we don't have with virtual machines, just fair to note. And we run a build command, if you're not familiar with Docker. So you can see I've actually called npm install. I have make files for all this stuff. Makes my life easy. Um, we have a Docker build. The dot at the end is basically saying just build from the Docker file you can file in this directory. What this does is it actually creates like a binary for you. It's an actual image that can then be shipped around. 
The tag here is kind of important. Um, I'll go into details of why it says gcr.io on it. Um, that's primarily because I'm doing some Google Cloud stuff. But the important bits here is really that the name is Suki, and then there's an optional uh, colon, and basically what I like to think of as a version that I'm going to apply to that. So when I, ha when I have different updates for this Docker image, which I will do in a little bit, I can then increment that number, and it'll be slightly different. It'll still be the Suki version, or Suki, which is the name of my dog, and it will be uh, 0 0.2 and 0 0.3, and I can deploy from there. So what's the, the flow? Let's sort of recap how the flow works. So we have a Docker file, which we saw. We build it. We get ourselves a Docker image, and it has a tag. Okay, so we give, we've got a name for it, a unique name for it. And then what happens is that Docker image goes into what's called a repository, or you can call it a registry. I've seen both in both places. That repository is basically exactly where that Docker image gets shared around from. Yeah, it's that central place where you're like, oh, I need that image of Suki from like 0 0.1, please, and I'd like to pull it down so I can run it. And that's where the gcr.io slash connect.js comes from. Basically, Google Cloud Platform comes with a private Docker repository. So I can use that. And the way I use that is basically I specify gcr.io slash connect.js. Connect.js is the name of my project. And I'm able to use that private repository. Um, if you're working with Docker files, you're doing open source stuff, there's a public one that Docker has. It's very useful. I have stuff up there as well. So once I have stuff in a repository, brilliant. That's great. Then I can actually deploy stuff from it and share it around and do things. Cool. All right, let's show you that my little Docker project actually works, and it does what it should do. Uh, what am I doing? Move four? No, it's five. OK, cool. So um, I cr I've already created um, an image based on what I had before, so that Docker file and stuff. So I'm basically just going to run it. Um, I have a run command. No, no. I can't spell over my shoulder. There we go. Yeah, no. That's what I want. Can't remember my targets. Docker serve. Thank you. Okay. So again, we have inside this Docker container a unique and individual snowflake. But all I call is Docker Run. It's my standard API. That's great. And it starts up my server. Oh. And this is opening your tab in the wrong window. That's okay. That's what I wanted. Okay, and I have a running website that has a picture of my dog. Cool. So my Express app works, and my Docker image works, and now you can see a picture of my dog. Are we all happy? Okay, cool. All right, any questions so far? Basic Docker stuff, go for it. Uh, the port number is different because it's running inside a Docker container, and I could, when you expose ports on Docker, generally it'll remap them to something local. Um, I could have made it the same, but it just that's that's just what it does. And I've got some commands to go look that up and spit that out again. Go for it. So the question was, what um, what hosts am I running on? So generally, you're running Docker containers on Linux. Um, I believe there's been some work to get it running on Windows. I don't know what state it's in. Doesn't really matter. So I'm running it on Ubuntu. Uh, you can run it on CentOS. You can run it on CoreOS. You can run it on all sorts of stuff. And there are flavors like CoreOS, for example, is a, a really good like a flavor of Linux that is specifically tailored for running Docker. Um, but you can run it on pretty much anything. Cool. No. Yep. So the question was, um, locally, if you're working on development, you might run it on Ubuntu, but you know, in reality, you might run it on CoreOS. Yeah, you could do that. You could totally do that. And that is, again, it's also the nice power of Docker. What I have running locally is the same as what I have on the cloud. So I can shift it wherever it needs to go, and it should work exactly the same. One more. So the question was whether basically the idea is not to provision a whole machine from scratch, but to create a new Docker image. 
Um, I don't know if the entire idea is that, but yes, that definitely helps because it means you can run multiple containers on a single machine and then you can use up the resources of that entire machine. Now, you may end up spinning up more machines as you need to do that, but yeah, that, that gives you that benefit of, of nice resource usage across machines. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. All right. Okay, so we, go this, we did this, um, this Docker stuff. That seems great. Cool. Why do we need Kubernetes? What's, what's the point of that? So let's dig into that. So, okay. So you're like, okay, this is great. Um, you're talking about Docker, great. I now have standard tools for run, for deploy. I can pull down images from my repository. I can get them running. I can use like Docker, Docker log to look at my logs. I can do Docker PS to see what, what stuff's running. Like my APIs are standard and it doesn't matter what I build. Sweet. Okay, so what does this look like when I'm running it. So this is the image we were looking at before, but in reality, it probably looks maybe something like this. Maybe you're running a couple of servers, and on those servers, you might have six containers. On the other server, you might have four. And that's not too bad. Um, it's, you know, you can have some redundancy, you know, and you can do all sorts of nice stuff that way. But you sort of hit some issues when, say, oh, one of your systems has an out of memory, or another one, goes down because of a race condition or something like that. That means you're still getting up at three o'clock in the morning and going, oh man, I'm just gonna have to restart these things and bring them back up. And then you go back to bed and you're like, oh, okay. It was easier because I've just got standard commands. I don't have to remember like the specific thing for this app, but it's still not so much fun. And then two weeks from now, everything's been stable for a while, one of your servers catches on fire. And you go, oh, uh, do I have this Docker image running on any other servers? I can't remember. Oh, well, let's just grab them all and we'll chuck them on another machine and it's 4 o'clock in the morning and I don't know what's going on. Um, it's not great. So you, you've got some wins, but you're still thinking to yourself, wouldn't it just be really nice if there was something that I could just be like, hey, can you run 10 instances of this container and 10 instances of this container and like 20 instances of that one and it just keeps them alive for me and if one of them goes down, it just makes sure everything's okay. Wouldn't that be kind of nice? That would, I mean, that would be kind of nice, right? So funnily enough, Google, some smart people at Google got together and they said, yeah, that would be really nice. Um, and they put together this project called Kubernetes. Uh, so Kubernetes is an open source orchestration system for Docker containers. And the really nice thing about it is it lets you specify the state you want your cluster of machines to be in. And then it works really, really hard to make sure that that state is maintained. Like everything ends up in that state. Um, it runs on just about everything. It's an open source project. Uh, we have a hosted version on Google Cloud Platform called Container Engine that I should make you aware of. Um, but you can also run it on Azure or AWS or your own machines. Um, so if you're running on one platform, you can pick up and move to another. It's actually kind of really nice that it makes it super, super portable. So I'm going to talk about um, some of the concepts behind Kubernetes so that they make sense. And so I can tell you how Kubernetes basically reaches, basically does the things that I'm telling you it does. So there's a couple of core concepts that um, I think are really important to Kubernetes. Um, and I'll explain them with a couple of metaphors here. The first one, which I'm not sure I particularly appreciate on some levels, but I can't think of a better way to explain um, because it works really well, is the idea of cattle and not pets. And what do we mean by that? So a pet, like my dog, is beloved to me. It is a uniquely named thing. I give it lots of attention. And if it gets ill, I take it to the vet. And I'm like, please make my pet better. I love it. Cattle, on the other hand, is kind of en masse. It has a number. One is much like any other. I don't really care about one versus, versus another. I don't really care. They run together as a group. And if one of them kind of gets ill, then I'm like, all right, we'll just make hamburger out of that one, and we'll get another cattle. Like I said, I don't know if I like this so much. But it, it, it explains the concept really, really well. And there's a second concept I like, which is what we were talking about, which is desired state. Right? So the, uh, the metaphor I like to use here is the self-driving car versus, say, what you see in a cab truck. The self-driving car, I tell it my desired state. I would like to go to this address, please. And it says, okay, I will work out the route that you take, and I will work out how fast I need to go, and how close I need to be to the cars in front of me, and I can make sure that happens, and you can go off and do other things. 
getting in a cab truck, I have to switch gears, there's a lot of knobs, I don't know what they do, I have to decide when I turn right and when I turn left. And while yes, driving a manual car or a stick shift car, as I know it's called in this country, um, can be a lot more fun, you have to be prepared to put in that time to really learn how it all works. So what does that mean when we actually talk about Kubernetes? So how does it, how does it do things? So the first thing I want to talk about is that Kubernetes treats the entire cluster pretty much as a single entity. It really doesn't care about the nodes within your cluster, so single machines. So when we talk about cattle versus pets, we're also talking at a machine level. So what you do then is you can say, um, actually, let me backtrack for a sec. So when we're talking about it as a cluster, this is nice because then we can add nodes to our cluster, and that's okay. And if a machine actually catches on fire, that's less of a concern for us. We're like, fine, just dump it in the, you know, in the scorched heap of other machines that set on fire. That's not so bad. So, but also, it means that when a container goes down, and we've told it how many containers we want to have running, it's going to come back up. It may not come back up on the same machine. It may come back up on a different machine. Because again, the containers are cattle, and the machines are cattle. We don't really care about both of them. And if a whole node goes down, we can then also be like, oh, well, that's OK. Kubernetes is just going to shift all the containers that are running on that machine to another machine. So we get, we get that nice, we, we, don't, we don't really care about each machine. We don't care about each container. They can be ephemeral, because Kubernetes is going to be like, I'll keep them up for you. That's OK. So what's the actual thing within Kubernetes that does this? It has a concept of what it calls controllers. Um, if you wrap your head around anything within Kubernetes, this is like the one thing that probably is worth wrapping your head around. Um, and its job is to basically say this. What is my current state on Kubernetes? What is my desired state on Kubernetes? Is there a difference? And if there is, let's make it so that the actual state looks like the desired state. So we had a thing called a replication control that we're going to look at in a minute that does exactly that. We tell it how many instances of something we want to run, and it turns around and says, is that how many we have? And then it will make sure that that happens. So what does that look like? So we actually give Kubernetes um, configuration files. You can write them in YAML. You can write them in JSON. Um, I find writing JSON by hand particularly problematic. I typo that stuff all the time, so I write it in YAML. And we end up uploading these files up to Kubernetes. So let's, let's go through this a little bit slowly because there's actually a bunch of interesting little things in here. Um, but once we kind of get through this, this gives us a, a really good core of what, what Kubernetes is doing. Okay, so first step first. Um, we actually specify the, no, I'm not gonna throw that over. First line there, you can see it says kind replication controller. We're creating a replication controller. We give it a name, which is actually quite important in the metadata section, uh, of webs-v1. And inside the spec, we say replicas three. So whatever containers are attached to this replication controller, we want three of them, please. Great, that's a good start. So I'm gonna jump down a little bit further, and I'm gonna see, you see there's a container section. Here it has a name, um, and we also have an image. We saw that before, that's our tag from before, and that tells it what image it is. Now we can actually have multiple containers attached to this replica controller. If you actually look at the Kubernetes docs, they refer to them as pods and groups of the containers. I'm not gonna worry about that too much right now, because I think it, it confuses things just a little bit. For, for right now, we're just gonna deal with a single Docker container running against the replication controller, because it makes the concepts, I think, a little easier to explain. So, we've got a replication controller that says replicas three, and we have some containers that we want to make sure run always, always, there's always three of them. Now, this is specified in the same file, but the connection isn't immediately obvious, so let me explain it. You'll notice up here also we have a label section. Kubernetes has a concept of labels. They're basically key values that you can attach to pretty much anything you have inside Kubernetes. These are actually really important. You can attach them to anything, and it makes things really flexible. So what we're going to do is we're going to attach two labels to our running container. One that says the role is web, and one we're actually going to give it a version of v1. These are arbitrary. We can actually choose whatever we want. Um, that version tag seems to be quite common. I've seen that as a pattern people are using. And what that means is, is that running the running container that is uh, of the image of Suki 0.1 always has the tags of role of web and version v1. You'll also notice 
over on the replication controller, we have a selector. This is what tells this is what tells the replication controller, hey, I need you to make sure to go look out for any containers that have a tag of web and v1, and I want you to make sure there's always three of those. That's how the two things are tied together. Does that make sense? I want to make sure that makes sense. That's like that's like if you get this, then you're like, okay, I can actually go and use Kubernetes to integrate. Like it's 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 pretty important. Cool. All right. So we have a replication controller, we tell it how many we want, we tell it what labels to look for, and then we have an image which has labels and they all join up. Okay, great. So once we have these, we now have running containers. We have a replication controller running, we have running containers, we know they're going to stay up because Kubernetes is going to take care of it. Um, I'll make a small note here. If you have multiple replication controllers, make sure they don't overlap. Like don't have the streams crossed like in Ghostbusters, bad things happen. And actually Kubernetes won't really let you do it. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we have that version tag. It's really so we can get that uniqueness within that replication controller. And we can make sure that things don't overlap when we start to do updates, which we'll look at in a little bit while. Okay, so we have a replication controller, we have running containers, sweet. Okay, but we have containers. We've talked about them being essentially ephemeral, right? They can go up, they can go down. So how do we talk to them? Because they sort of, they have IP addresses, um, but obviously they're ephemeral, so we can never guarantee that thing's gonna be there. We need something that sort of sits really kind of at the load balancer level, where we can be like, okay, we know this thing is always gonna be there, so that when we call it, it'll know where to send out information and we can interact with these containers that are running. So, would you believe Kubernetes has this thing and it calls it services. So services are pretty straightforward, they're actually quite simple. They have a, a fixed virtual IP address, so you always know where they are once they're up and running. Um, and they have a selector, very much like a replication controller. So they can turn around and say, I would like to expose the containers that match this particular selector. That's really all there is to it. So if we have a look at one, and this is the uh, my Suki service, that shows my pictures of my dog. Um, it's kind as a service. This is our YAML file that will push up to Kubernetes. It has a selector you can see at the bottom where it says role equals web. So we'll just say, we're not gonna worry about the version for now. We just want anything that says web, that has a role of web, we're gonna expose it. Uh, target port expects the port to be open on 8080, but we're then gonna show it up to the world on port 80. The other neat thing about this is that um, we put a type on there of load balancer. What that actually means uh, for most of the cloud providers that uh, let you run Kubernetes on them or have like a hosted Kubernetes, that actually sets up a real load balancer. Um, and it does exactly that on Google Cloud Platform as well. Um, there's a variety of options you've got there for, for, for firing up services, but that actually fires up a real load balancer that we'll see. Again, fixed IP address, and it'll expose everything that has a role of web. All right, let's see if this stuff really works. <laughs> Are the demo gods going to be with me today? All right, so, um, where are we? Uh, we don't want that one, we want one. Lovely, okay, so I have some make files here. Um, and we're gonna set those up. Okay, let me bear with me one sec, lovely. Beautiful. So what we're going to do first is set up a replication controller so that we have some containers actually running. So let's make, yeah, it would be good if I was on the right screen. Make create RC. So how do we do that? There is this kubectl command that is basically your command line interface to Kubernetes. There are REST APIs as well. And we basically just pass it that YAML file we were looking at. I have a nice visualization of what's going on, and it's running on four. We went over here, and of course it's not working. Because, because things hate me. Because my internet's not working. Okay, the replication controllers are up. Oh, come on. Go on, do what I want. Uh, it's such a nice. That's all right. I can cheat it if this isn't going to work. Which 
a shame because it is a really nice demo. Go on. If need be, I'll switch to it another way. I'll demo it through the command line. really doesn't want to work for me today. Oh. So let's go over here, kubectl. Okay, we'll do it this way instead. That's unfortunate. Um, that really sucks. But the demo gods are not with me. I will try one more time. So setting up a proxy. See if we can hit the API. Yeah, okay, that works. Hates me. <laughs> ah, ah, that's right. Move ahead. Okay. So instead of doing it that way, what I will do is I will get pod through the command line. And we can see what's running. Okay, so we have three containers running. That is nice. Let me then I will uh, make sure. ignore that. <laughs> That's fine. Um, actually, never mind. Okay, so we have. Um, just trying to decide how I want to do this. Okay, cool. Actually, I changed my mind. There. Beautiful. Ah, that works. Okay, so we have three pods running. Great. We can now, all right. Bleh. That just threw me for a loop, didn't it? That's all right. Provision, deployment, all right, perfect. This will work really well. Okay, so we created ourselves a replication controller and we have three pods running. The interesting thing to note at this point is you can actually see the names are just randomized. So we've got web-v1, again, it's cattle, yeah? Any of these containers could be shut down at any point in time, and the replication controller would spin, back, would spin it back up. If we had a nice visualization, you'd see a nice box that pointed to three individual uh, containers, and they would be controlling one and the other. But we don't, so, so be it. If I can continue working this way, then I will continue doing that. There we go. Okay, so we have three of these running. What we really want, though, is to actually now have a service that runs on top. So let's deploy that. Uh, this is going to be fun, actually. Make this. So the command is exactly the same. We start up a service by passing it a file, and it knows, okay, great, I'm going to start a service. Now, this actually takes a little bit to run, uh, just because what it's actually doing is firing up a load balancer in the back end. And what I'm going to actually have to do is log into my cloud console so I can get the IP address which is fun too, which I will do here while that's running in the background. So that'll spin up our actual service in the back end. Um, it's a real shame that it, the visualization isn't working, but the nice thing about this is then you can see that the service is running and it's looking for everything that says role web. So if I come over here and I say kubectl, get services, Suki, uh, it is, uh, visualize is true, we should actually, is actually a bit of metadata that should tell it it should visualize, but it's not working, so that's fine. <laughs> and is looking for all equals web. And that'll come up in a minute. Yeah, it's running really slow. Oh, oh, ah! And it looks like that! <laughs> so there's our replication controller, and there are our three instances. Okay, that's awesome, yay! Okay. So that was meant to be running in the background and doing a bunch of other things. Um, okay, so what about when we were talking about scaling, right? So we've already told Kubernetes, hey, let's have three instances, but we realize we need more load and we need five instances. Wouldn't it be great if there was a generic way of doing that that just applies across all containers? Would you believe that Kubernetes will do that for you? So. I run uh, resize, I can turn around to Kubernetes and I can say, 
hey, would you mind now on this replication controller, rather than giving me three, could you just give me five? And would you believe, now suddenly I have five. And the neat thing about the label system here that's worth noting is the way the service is running is it's always constantly saying, I'm just going to expose anything that has the label of web. And if I've got five, 50, 100 containers and they all have the label of web, it's always going to connect to them. And that's, that's pretty cool. All right, so we have our running application because now I have an IP address which I can click on, which is great. Oh, and apparently it's going to, if I open a new tab, Awesome, I have a picture of my dog that is scalable to thousands of people. <laughs> Wonderful, but there's a problem. There's only one picture of my dog. We need lots of pictures of my dog. So how do we do updates? Now, how many people here have written scripts that roll things in and out of load balancers? Okay, way less than I expected. Okay, that's fine. How many people have done that by hand? I've done that by hand too. Yeah, okay. So again, we come back to this whole idea of containers allow us to solve general problems in a nice general way and abstract away that unique and individual snowflake. So wouldn't it be great if Kubernetes gave us a way to basically roll our updates <laughs> in and out of load balancers with no downtime because that's a common problem that everyone needs to solve. So, that. so here's my node app, and I'll move the thing over here. I want a different view. I'm going to say index two, which is actually a index that has multiple pictures with my dog on it. That's, that's literally that's the only change. Now, I prepared earlier, just like a good cooking show, uh, a version of Suki 0.2, and I put it up on my repository already. So that's already up there and ready to go. How do I how do I update this? If I tab over. I write myself a new replication controller. So I have a new replication controller. I will call it webv2. I change on basically everything. So version v2, and then if I scroll all the way down the bottom, is I change my image. So my selector for this replication controller is role of web, but the version is v2. So it's specific to the containers that I'm specifying here. And I change the image. And I can push this up. I can be like, hey, I want this replication controller to be running. But rather than just pushing it up and letting it do its thing, um, there's a lovely command. Let me go to here. Uh, make update. Which is kubectl rolling update. And what does that do? Basically what it does is it takes two controllers. And we'll actually look at it. And here. Of course it's down. Oh, there we go. It's beautiful. Um, unfortunately, those two overlap a little bit. But what you'll see it doing is it'll add a new v2. Any minute now. There it is. And then it'll say, oh, I've got one too many of these. And it'll scale down the v1s. And it'll just repeat this process. So it'll take the v1s and it'll say, hey, let's slowly drop those downs and slowly replace those with v2s. And it'll sit behind the load balancer and do that for you. Again, it's a generic solution to a really basic problem that everyone sort of has. But we can do it because we're running Docker, which is containers, and we're running Kubernetes because we can solve these sort of problems. So let's wait for that to finish. Now, um, the nice thing here is actually you can specify things like update period. Uh, so how long is it going to take to roll everything through? I've got it set to one second because I'm doing a demo. Uh, in reality, you probably want something a little bit longer just as you slowly roll things up. You might say, oh, is this working? Is it failing? If it isn't, let's stop this. It's a bad idea. Okay, that should all be done now. Okay, brilliant. So now we have all V2s. We have a look at our website now. So if we hadn't waited, that's actually a really good question. He asked the question of um, if we hadn't waited, what happens? So if, it, if I hadn't waited and I hit the website, then I could get the old one or I could get the new one. And it depends. And depending on the internet, I've got like a bunch of images and they're all kind of large. Eventually, we will get lots of pictures of my dog. Come on, they should be all in cache. All right, I'll keep talking while that's going. There we go. Oh God, what happened there? We did not test on this screen resolution. Or this is, this is responsive design. Uh, <laughs> so yes, we have lots of pictures of my dog. And now that I've moved to San Francisco, apparently you can take your dog into stores. This is crazy, um, but I digress. 
Okay, so we have our Kubernetes demo. Uh, we can run our app. We can deploy it. Um, we can update it. That's all very nice. There is a whole lot more to Kubernetes that I haven't gone anywhere near, but hopefully I've given you enough inspiration that you're like, this is awesome. Um, so there's things like persistent volumes. So if you need to store state, uh, DNS for doing service discovery, there's secrets for environment variables, logging, monitoring, events for state change, QBI, all sorts of bits and pieces. There's lots and lots of goodness and there's a, a really good roadmap coming up as well. So there's lots of good stuff coming. But I wanted to give you enough of both Docker and Kubernetes so that you could at least sit back and be like, okay, I know enough to know whether this is going to be a fit for what it is that I'm doing or it's not going to be a fit for what it is that I'm doing. And that's fair enough if it's not. So let's put a nice bow on it and then we can ask some questions. So wrapping up, we started with this unique individual snowflake of beautiful, beautiful proportions. Um, I, know, I know that's what my code looks like when I write it. We then wrapped it up in a nice Docker container so that we could use generic tooling to solve essentially basic problems that a lot of us have with software development in regards to scale. And because we could do that, we could take Kubernetes, which is a generic solution to scaling problems, and we could apply it over the top of our unique and individual snowflake and make our application scale. If you're interested in Kubernetes, I have to make a plug for this, and it's not just because I work for them, okay? but you can take it with a grain of salt. If you want to play with Kubernetes and you don't want to go through the pain of setting up a cluster, which can be lots of fun, if that's your type of thing, um, you can actually go to Google Cloud Platform, click that button, say how many nodes you want, and we'll spin one up for you like that. Uh, we also have free trials, so it's like a really easy way of getting on there. And the nice thing is, it's also Kubernetes, so you can pick up and move if you need to. Um, but it's enough to get yourself started and get your feet wet. So finally, thank you very much for having me. We've got a good solid 10 minutes for questions. Um, if you want to reach out to me at any point in time, at Neurotic on Twitter is generally the best way to do it, and then you can find all my other stuff from there. Obviously, docker.com for uh, the website, kubernetes.io for Kubernetes type stuff, uh, cloud.google.com slash container engine if you want to get started with Kubernetes and you want a quick and fast way to do it. So thank you very much for having me, and I'll open the floor up to questions, please. All the way back. So the question was, if I use Docker, how that impacts my developer workflow? So uh, I kind of have a whole other talk about that. <laughs> it's a long discussion. Um, which side of it do you want to talk about? Like, how do you develop when you're developing with Kubernetes specifically, or how do I build and test? Like, there's so many things we could talk about here. Yep. Nice. Yeah. That's a great question. Uh, so, how do you how do you like test like microservices across a giant architecture? Um, I have seen like a million talks on this very subject because it is complicated, and that's one of the complexities of microservices. Um, and the fact of the matter is, just because you're running on Kubernetes doesn't mean you have to run microservices either, like they're Docker containers. Um, there are a variety of solutions to that. I've seen stuff like Pact for doing microservice testing based on um, contracts, which I've never actually touched, but it's meant to be very nice. Um, the nice thing about Kubernetes is it's also very easy to spin up clusters. So there are options for doing it locally. I've found that a little bit hit and miss. Um, I find the easiest option really is just, just you've got a couple of options. You could actually fire up the whole cluster just for your development team, just with smaller numbers. Um, and you could have them share it. Kubernetes also has a nice thing called namespaces, so you can segregate stuff from each other. So you could have on the same cluster te test, dev, stage, you know, all that running in the same one, just in different namespaces and have them segregated. You could do it that way too. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a complicated one, and I don't know if there's necessarily a silver bullet solution. Um, so it's, yeah, I don't know if I can give you a straight answer on that one, but that's a great conversation to have, and we should probably have it over some drinks. I would love to have that conversation. Nothing? No one else? Ah, there we go. So the question was, how might Vagrant fit into this? Um, that's an excellent question. So there, uh, that's a broad question as well. There is a Vagrant script to firing up a local Kubernetes cluster. 
Um, I ran it and didn't have the best success with it, I'll be completely honest with you. Um, I found the salt provisioning a little bit hit and miss, but take it for a spin and if it works, great, and if it doesn't, then you'll know very, very quickly. Um, and there's nothing to say if, that, if that's your desired workflow. You know, if you can get that provisioning to work, then it works great. Um, I actually want to put some bugs in on it. Um, is that the side of things you were sort of talking about when you said Vagrant? Well, so if we, like, if you want to leverage Docker, yep. we can't Vagrant. We basically put a bunch of Docker and try to save a lot. So, the local development story around Kubernetes is a fun one. Um, my take on it these days is to have a cluster somewhere. And, and deploy to that because realistically you want your local development to mimic your production as much as possible. Obviously you want to do unit testing and all that sort of fun stuff to make sure all that works. But actually doing like all your integration tests, having a cluster is, is really useful. Um, you could, I, I've seen people do like basically mimicking things with like say Docker Compose, stuff like that where you can build up a network that looks like all your interconnected pieces. That would work. I, I get scared because if it's not running on a real cluster and it's not quite the same, something could go horribly wrong. Um, but it could be a nice interim step. Um, the tools, as you can see, like when I'm running like kubectl, like locally, that integrates really nicely to anything running in the cloud. So that actually has um, a configuration file that says where is this, this cluster, and then I can integrate, like I can just call commands on it. And I'm really just pushing up YAML files and pulling down Docker images. Um, the only downside there is that you are then pushing up images into the cloud for development and then sort of seeing if they run, and that, that cycle can not be the best. Um, but again, if you can get small enough Docker images, it's not too bad. So, it's, yeah. It's a fun one. I've had conversations with some of the people I know who do like a lot of work with Kubernetes, and that local development type situation is an interesting story. I know different people have come at it in different ways. I saw someone put a hand up over here. Uh, what's the auto scaling story? Ah, very good question. So the question was, what's the auto scaling story in Kubernetes? Uh, the answer to that question is soon. Um, the roadmap. Um, I want to double check it. But it was late October was the 1.1 release was when they were targeting it. And I am 95% positive that auto scaling was on there. Um, Terry, Terry's putting his thumb up. Yes, he also has seen it. Um, I was looking at it last night trying to remember just so I could answer questions like that. Um, there's some also really neat stuff on the roadmap, like the one, uh, like bigger cluster sizes and performance. And um, it's, it's all on a, a roadmap.md that's on, on GitHub. Uh, no, I do not have any idea how that works. It's magic as far as I'm concerned. Um, no, I actually have no idea at all. I haven't looked at it at all. But yeah, that has been like the one feature request that everyone has been like, so. But for 1.0, they were like, we want the basic stuff. And so being able to say, I want five or three or two. Yeah, that's cool. Sorry, put one there and one there. Go for it. The load balancer that was part of the demo. So the load balancer that actually spins up um, is actually a network load balancer from Google Cloud Platform. So if you're running Kubernetes on, excuse me, on most of the cloud providers that provide it, they have hooks that'll spin up real load balancers for it. Um, if you're provisioning it yourself, I would have to look at the documentation <laughs> of how you hook that up. But there are ways of exposing stuff through stable IPs. That there's a couple of different ways of exposing services. You can do some neat stuff. There was a question over there. Oh yeah. I tend to, yeah. Um, there is an official node package, but it's big. It's really big, and I think it has npm in it, and it's probably based on Debian. Um, if I'm building a development environment, like where I want to build stuff, I tend to go there. Um, but when I push stuff into production, I tend to stick it on Alpine. I, I like Alpine. It's nice and small, and it tends to run pretty well. But you can usually find there's like a Alpine package for something that everyone seems to be using. Uh, either that, or it's actually not. It, the package manager on Alpine is pretty decent. So if you can't find something that's like a pre-built image, you can normally just build it by going package install thing. I forget what the exact command is, but yeah, I like I like Alpine a lot. <laughs> One more. Huh? Actually, we've got a bit more time, so go for it. Yep. But it's low scale. Yep. And I've been wondering what the, what the overhead is of Docker. Uh, and you know, when you start really scaling up, and I know there's you know, yep. 
very yes. So the question is, what's the overhead of Docker containers? Um, it tends to be quite low. It doesn't. It doesn't tend to be large because uh, we were talking about it before. They share kernels, right? Um, and that's why it becomes so fast to spin up. It's nowhere near the overhead of say virtual machines, which is a much larger overhead. Obviously, there's going to be some, and that's the trade-off you're making. But I don't think it's going to be anything that's really going to make you worry. And it gives you the ability to really scale horizontally in a really nice way. So, um, but even the interesting thing that I've, I've actually run into people who run like really small Kubernetes clusters. So they're not like huge scale. They might run like two nodes or three. Um, but they really like it because of the ease of deployment, the ease of updating, like all that stuff. So they're like, okay, we'll run a small Kubernetes cluster of like two machines or three machines, and that makes our lives easier. Um, and then when we actually have to worry about real scale, then we can just add nodes as we see fit. All right, I'm going to do one more because then I'll get people a five minute break. Go for it. Um, So Kubernetes does have hooks into monitoring. There's a whole like uh, there's all sorts of stuff you can do there and like logging packages. Google Cloud Platform itself um, has all that stuff built in. Hey, yes. um, and I suppose most of the other cloud providers probably do as well. Um, but yeah, there's add-ons for logging and all sorts of stuff. I, I forget exactly which ones they are, but for like putting stuff in Elasticsearch and doing all sorts of fun stuff. Um, again, it's the nice thing about something like this. It's all Docker, right? So we can be generic about it, and we can provide that sort of solution for a very common problem, which is making sure this thing doesn't entirely fall over. All right, cool. Um, give you a few minutes just to finish early. I have Kubernetes stickers, so if anyone would like any, I know people love stickers. Uh, please feel free to come up. I am obviously here for the rest of the conference. Uh, if you can't find me, Terry, do you want to wave? Terry is also here. He is my teammate and awesome colleague. Um, if you can't find me, please feel free to bug him. Um, but I, I would love to talk to anybody about Docker, Kubernetes, or anything to do with programming languages. So thank you very much for having me, and have a great conference. I have too many. Oh, yeah, go for the stickers. Yeah.